Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. Uh, my name is Jessica, I'm with KNA Greenhouse. Uh, this presentation is going to be on the evergreens that can tolerate juglone chemical toxicity. Um, and just as a note, there's a lot of different lists on the, on the internet um, from different sources. This is basically going to be what I have found to grow underneath the black walnut trees that grow on my property. Um, little background, I have about four acres of uh, forested and some lawn that still has a lot of black wal larger black walnut trees on it. So I have, <laughs> I have a very, very small area that I can grow the sensitive plants under, but a majority of the four acres is all walnut trees. Um, so I've been experimenting. We joke at k and that, that my property is the test property for seeing if a plant is, is walnut tolerant or not. Um, so this presentation is basically what I have found uh, will grow under the walnut trees on my property. So the first question to answer is what is juglone? Um, I do have uh, another presentation on juglone tolerant shrubs. So this question is also answered in that presentation, so you can skip ahead if, you, if you've watched that one. Um, but basically juglone is a chemical produced by only a certain number of trees. Not all trees are going to have the chemical. Um, black walnut has the highest concentration of the chemical, um, but the butternut, pecan, and shagbark hickory trees will also have a lower concentration of, of that chemical. Um, and the, the kind of obnoxious thing about it is it basically is in all parts of the tree, so it's not just the root system and it's not just the leaves, it's everything. So, you know, the roots obviously grow underground, so the chemical's already going to be in the soil. Um, but every time the walnuts fall off in late summer, early fall, you'll get the chemicals um, exuded as, as the walnuts break down. Same thing with the leaves in the fall. When, when the leaves fall um, and break down, you'll get it kind of coming out of the, of the breakdown process there too. Um, and some people have thought, well, if, you know, you cut down the walnut tree or butternut tree, um, that basically gets rid of the issue, but that's not the case because, as I said, it's in the root system as well. So the, the research that I've done have said, has said that um, the chemical can remain in the soil up to uh, 15 years after the tree is already cut down. So really it doesn't doesn't do a whole lot of good to cut down that tree. Just need to kind of be aware of of what plants can grow underneath underneath the uh, black walnut trees or other trees that ha that give off that juglone chemical. So some of the symptoms that you'll see on a plant that is affected by the chemical, um, the leaves will start to wilt um, prematurely. Um, they, they sometimes turn yellow and then will oftentimes fall off of the, the plant um, earlier than they should. Um, stunted growth all over with the, sometimes the leaves are a little bit smaller, but generally speaking, um, the plant basically just doesn't grow. Um, I have a couple of plants that I think are juglone sensitive underneath some of my, my walnut trees, and that's just because I've, I've had them planted for four or five years and they are the exact same size as they were when I planted them. Um, so they're not growing, but again, they're basically just surviving uh, because they haven't died, which is the ultimate issue. Um, a lot of times juglone sensitive plants will die um, from, from being under walnut trees if they're very sensitive. Um, so there are some that basically stay the same size as they are uh, when you when you plant them, um, but a majority of them actually will end up dying, sometimes even within that first season that you plant them. Now because uh, this is an evergreen presentation, um, I will be going over broadleaf evergreens as well as um, just the regular evergreen, like the, the needled coniferous evergreens. Um, I did put the broadleaf evergreens in the shrub presentation as well, so there's a few um, slides that'll be overlapping um, between these two presentations, but uh, boxwood is one of them that will definitely grow underneath walnut trees. Um, I have quite a few on my property, um, a few different varieties also. The, like the green mountain that's, that's in the center photo here is the pyramid shaped boxwoods and I have one of those on my property doing just fine. Um, and then most of, of the other boxwood varieties are going to be of the globe shape. So 
there's Chicago Land Green, um, Mont Bruno is a variety, Green Velvet, Wintergreen. There's quite a few different varieties. We are not able to find um, the variegated one, which you see in the right-hand photo. Um, I am holding out hope that I'll be able to find it yet this summer, but I was not able to get it on order for us for the spring delivery. So we'll see if I can get that one in, but that is another option. Um, the variegated one is also um, tolerant to um, being planted under the walnuts. Um, just a note also, as I said, they're broadleaf evergreen, so they won't have any fall color, but you you will still have the leaves that remain all season long. And these, um, they they will leaf out on top of the the previous year's growth. So you won't, they won't lose their leaves at all, where some of the broadleaf evergreens actually do sometimes lose their leaves in spring um, before they re-leaf out again. So with boxwoods, it's just basically new growth on top of, of the old growth. And there's a couple different sizes, um, like Mont Bruno, I believe is the smallest one that we usually get in. Um, typically, the globe-shaped ones are three or four feet tall and wide, um, and then the Green Mountain one typically is four to five feet tall. Um, and because it's pyramid shaped, it's going to be wider at the base than it is at the top. So the Daphne, um, the variety that is hardiest here in Wisconsin is called Carol Mackey, uh, which is the one that we do sell and the one that's pictured here. Um, Daphne is one of them, like I was just talking about, where it the leaves remain on all winter long, but then when they leaf out again in spring, the previous year's leaves, uh, at least on my property, they they would fall off as the new leaves were emerging. So uh, just something to keep in mind. They do keep the variegation all season long. So you have the kind of like mint green color with that cream or white edge, and then the flowers bloom in May, and they are slightly fragrant. So you will, you will need to get up pretty close to be able to smell the fragrance on them. It's not like... Um, like a mock orange you can smell from far away, lilacs you can will bowl you over <laughs> some of the varieties. Um, so this one you will have to make a, an effort to to smell the fragrance on them. But they have pink berries, I'm sorry, pink buds and uh, the white flowers um, in typically in May. Uh, generally speaking, this is a very slow growing plant as well. Mature size will be about three feet by three feet and kind of has that rounded shape. Um, Part sun is best for this one, but it will handle full sun. I don't know if it would be okay in full shade or not. I never really tried it there. Um, generally speaking, four hours or more is probably the best option for this one. And as a note, don't put it in overly wet soils. It doesn't like to have wet feet. So uh, if you can put it in a drier spot on your property, that would be better for this particular plant. And uh, Euonymus is another broadleaf evergreen. Um, there's quite a few different varieties. Some of them are smaller, more of like a ground cover type almost. Um, one of the common names is winter creeper. Um, some of them are a little bit taller and as a general rule, they, they tend to have kind of like uh, roots that, or feet, I call them feet, um, that will anchor themselves into brick or uh, tree bark. So if you plant them next to either of those two things, they will actually climb up like a vine. So not all the varieties will do that, but there are some that we sell that that can definitely do that and be a taller plant or even a vine um, if you're looking for something like that. The uh, Euonymus also that I'm talking about here um, is tolerant to full sun to full shade. So really you can plant it anywhere. Sun is best for for the best coloration on the variegated leaves. Um, but it, like I said, my, my parents actually had it planted on the north side of their home and probably got maybe two hours of sun a day and it was it was perfectly fine there. Um, and as a side note, the Euonymus here is, like I said, the broadleaf evergreen, not to be confused with the burning bush, which is also Euonymus. Um, we only sell one variety of that particular uh, Euonymus and uh, it is the non-invasive plant. Um, Compacta is, is on the non-invasive list with the DNR, whereas a lot of the other burning bush varieties are on the invasive list here in Wisconsin now. Um, but that is also, the burning bush is not tolerant to black walnuts. Um, the previous owners where I live planted, I think, eight or nine different sh burning bush shrubs all over the property, and every single one of them was dead when, when I moved in. So uh, that was basically because it cannot handle the, the juglone chemical. 
Okay, getting into more of the coniferous evergreen types. Um, fir is a great option for you. There are not a lot of um, taller evergreens that do well. So if you're looking for, you can see in the right hand photo, that's balsam fir. That one has the nice Christmas tree shape that a lot of people are looking for. Basically a rule of thumb is any pine and any spruce will not grow under walnut trees. So the previous owners also tried to plant a a uh, privacy hedge of Norway spruce along the front of the property and they are very sparse. There's barely any needles on them at all. I mean, it's it, it's not a privacy hedge because you can see through the trees. They just look horrible. Um, the other thing is, like I said, pines don't do well. I did try a couple of pine before I realized all pines were bad uh, because some of the lists actually only say, you know, white pine won't grow under there, but never said anything about, say, mugo pine. Uh, so I planted a couple of different types of pine, and every single one of them died within that first year. So anything pine, anything spruce don't do well. Fir, however, is a good option if you're willing to wait for them to get larger. Uh, the one caveat with fir is they typically do grow fairly slowly. Um, I do have a balsam fir underneath one of our walnut trees on the property here, and probably puts on, I would say, four inches of growth every year. So I got it as a little seedling, about 12 inches tall. It's probably about, I'd say two and a half feet tall by now. And I planted that seven years ago-ish, give or take. Um, so definitely not gonna fill in anytime soon unless you already get a fairly large uh, tree. Um, and that the, the uh, tolerance to the juglone chemical does extend to the smaller ones like you see in the left-hand photo. You know, there's some dwarf varieties like Piccolo and Nana um, the shrub forms also will be walnut tolerant. So junipers are a tricky one because it seems to me like some varieties are and some varieties are not. Um, these varieties I do have planted on my property so blue rug, blue chip, blue star are all uh, more of generally the low growing ones. Um, the, the blue star photo I have here is the bottom left hand corner. That one is the blue star on a standard. I have the shrub form of it multiple places on, on my property, um, but either one would be perfectly fine. There's moon glow in the center there, and that one I do also have on my property. Not doing the best, but it is because I learned after I planted it that it is in a very, very heavy clay soil area that does not drain that well, and junipers, as a general rule, typically like to have a drier spot. They do not like having, you know, wet soils that don't drain well, so that was my bad. Uh, but but it's doing okay close to a pretty large uh, walnut tree by our driveway. And then Dubs Frosted um, is another one, which you see on the, the right-hand side. That one is growing underneath some fairly large, actually, it's what I call the granddad walnut tree, which is the biggest one that we have on our property. Pretty sure it is the the mother or the the grandmother or granddad of all the other walnut trees on my property. Um, and the Dubs Frosted is doing very well. Um, there's, I had Blueberry Delight underneath them and all but one of them have died. So I don't know that that is particularly hardy. Um, so it really just kind of depends on the type of juniper. There's, I want to say three or four different um, species that we have. So just ask us, um, we can definitely point you in the right direction for that. But junipers, prefer full sun. Like I said, they're drought tolerant when they're established, so they do prefer well-drained sites, not heavy clay soil where it doesn't drain well, like where I planted uh, the one uh, moon glow. Um, and uh, general hardiness is right around a two or three. So these are a very hardy plant. They're juglone um, tolerant, so these are usually a pretty good option for you if you're looking for any kind of evergreen, um, low growing to pyramid shaped. And the larch, or otherwise known as tamarack, is another option for you. And um, the this particular tree does grow underneath walnut trees. I have had it in the past, but not for very long, just because I live on a wooded a wooded lot. Deer think tamaracks are candy. So unfortunately, while it did grow very well, the problem was that the deer ate them and killed them that way. So they didn't actually die from the walnut trees. 
Um, so if I can figure out a way to put a force field around Tamarax, just because even fencing it and spraying it with R repels all did nothing to keep the deer away from them. Um, yeah, until I can figure out a force field, I, I won't be able to plant these. But they are uh, juggalo intolerant. So with larches, uh, there's a couple different varieties that are on the market. We will have the native type that's native to Wisconsin. Um, Left-hand photo here is called Blue Sparkler, which is new for us this year. And um, sometimes we, we can get in some shorter, like basically shrub size, you know, three, four foot, uh, just depends on the year. And with large, as a, as a side note, it is kind of an anomaly. It's, it's a deciduous conifer, so it will actually lose its needles every late fall. G generally speaking, around November, you'll start to see, um, see the needles drop off. So summer photo of the leaves is it's what's on the uh, right hand side of your screen and in the center photo you can see the yellowing that's what they do in the fall so you'll get the really nice yellow fall color and then like i said they'll they'll drop all of their needles in the winter and then in spring regrow again for for the green or the blue green uh, coloring and canadian hemlock is another one that is really difficult for me to grow not because of the walnuts because they are very tolerant to juglone uh, but because of the deer uh, the canadian hemlocks again are like candy i have the the photo on the left hand side of your screen uh, that one's called jervis i do have that one planted actually in an area where the deer pass twice a day they'll they'll move from uh, east to west on the property in the morning and then west to east at the at the end of the day. And Jervis is kind of in their line of, of walking. So, so far, knock on wood, that one's been okay for one season. <laughs> uh, I did have summer snow, which you can see on the right-hand side of your screen. It's a little bit taller. It has white tips on it. And they devoured that one. Um, that, was, that was my bad. I forgot all about it and um, didn't fence that one in or anything over the winter. The, uh, the center photo there is Golden Duchess, which is a yellow uh, needled variety, and there's also Golden Duke, which we are not able to get in this season again, uh, but we should have some Golden Duchess for you. And then, of course, the, the native Canadian hemlock will grow um, underneath walnuts as well. So a lot of different heights and, and shapes and everything. Um, so definitely something to check out if you have a part sun to full shade for, for, this, um, for this spot. Uh, they do they do tolerate kind of moist sites. They, they prefer it not to be too dry. So if you have a spot, you're not really sure what to plant in there, but you want something evergreen, this would be a great option for you. And then this is a list that I have seen, you know, kind of from some other people. I don't necessarily have these on my property right now, um, but these are some other evergreens that maybe are juggalo intolerant. Um, Arborvita, I have two varieties one of them is doing okay and the other one died so i'm not sure what went wrong there if that was a walnut thing or not um but i also don't tend to plant a lot of arborvitae just because again of the deer population and i think most of us are familiar with the deer browsing line if you see you know the hedges of of arborvitae planted and then a line about six feet up where the deer ate everything down and then the rest of the plant is fine um, I just don't really want that on my property. So Arborvitae, maybe, we'll see. Um, you is listed on a lot of a lot of lists as somewhat tolerant. So I'm assuming that means like what I have on some of my shrubs where you plant it and that's the size it stays for the rest of its life versus getting to be, you know, sometimes yews can be pretty huge. So if you plant it as, at a, as a five foot plant from the garden center, it might just stay five feet instead of getting up to be 15 feet tall. Um, Chemisipris is kind of touchy. I have some planted on my property, but just because I live out in the country, I'm a zone four, zone five, depending on the year and where on my property you are. Um, they generally, fall cypress tend to live about one or two seasons on my property and then they don't come back. So that could be just because it's too cold on my property and not in the right zone. Could be the walnut trees. I don't know. It's hard to say. I can't get a great answer from from a lot of lists. And when I googled it, didn't really have an answer for me either. So who knows? Um, Dawn redwood is a big maybe. I had one of them planted. It died after two seasons, so I replanted it just because I love it so much. Um, and I think it's okay. It looks like it's gonna bud out again this year. So this would be the third season um, if it does actually grow. 
That one's another one, though, that the deer really enjoy. So I really had to fence that one off uh, the last couple of winters. And bald cypress is another question mark. Um, I was not really able to get a, a definitive answer when I Googled it. Um, and we don't have a lot of varieties that grow up here anyway, just because we're, I mean, generally speaking, it's native down Louisiana, um, really down, down south. So we don't see a lot of them up here anyway. Uh, there are a few varieties, though, that are zone 5. So if you want to try it out, feel free. I did one, and then the deer ate it. So <laughs> I just decided I was kind of over planting plants so that the deer could eat. Um, so those are other possible options for you if you just kind of want to push the envelope and see, see if that's something else that'll grow on your property. And that's really all that I have for you. The, the list of evergreens that grow underneath uh, um, trees that have juglone toxicity, uh, not really long. So the shrub list is definitely longer, but I hopefully I gave you some options for you uh, to take a look at. Um, otherwise, like I said, I have a, a juglone toxicity shrub presentation you could take a look at, and we do have a list um, in the nursery yard here. That, that we could also kind of help you out. We, we have some vines, we have um, some trees too that would be tolerant to the juglone chemical. So hopefully you found that a little bit educational and a little bit helpful. If you want to get a hold of us, you can email us at knagreenhouse at gmail.com or you can give us a call at either of those phone numbers. Um, if you have a question specifically for me, feel free to put attention Jessica in the subject line and I will be sure to get back to you. So thank you so much for joining.